Hi there, my name is Soon Young Yoon. In Korean, that means peace forever. I'm here to talk with you about sexual and reproductive health and rights as a human right. And for that, I would like to share a few images with you. Here we are. So one of the barriers that we need to talk about in talking about our human rights is violence against women and girls. And we know that that is a very basic structural barrier for us to exercise any of our human rights. And that includes leadership, decision-making, and all of the things which influence how we can exercise our sexual and reproductive health and rights. Our political voice is at stake if we receive threats of violence or if we are afraid to go out at night. There is an interparliamentary union study that shows that in their survey, more than 44% of women in politics said that they had received threats of death, rape, beatings, or abduction. And particularly for women in politics, they are faced with threats against their children. We live in a political culture of violence in general. We know that during COVID, violence against women, particularly domestic violence, rose extraordinarily. But it's also true that violence in general in cities and in countries also rose extraordinarily. So this culture of violence says that we resolve conflicts through violent means, simply. And an organization called ICANN estimates that over $138,000 is spent every day on nuclear weapons. And that is in contrast, the extraordinarily small amount of money that we know is invested in women's health. What are some of the barriers that we face besides violence against women and gender-based violence? Stereotypes, gender stereotypes, lack of access to justice, and also to health services. Gender stereotypes. So <clears throat> rape victims, women rape victims, are often blamed oh, you were just wearing a short skirt or you were acting alluringly, so that's why you invited trouble. These are wrong, and these are wrong stereotypes which are affecting our access to justice. I was in Tunisia at a very remote mobile health clinic and talking with a doctor about sexual and reproductive health services that that little mobile clinic was trying to provide. And he said one of his biggest problems was that boys were not coming to him, young men were not coming to him to talk about sexuality and health. And he said there is a culture of, in, in Latin America and in some cultures we would say machismo, which says that men and boys do not talk about sexuality and health and therefore they have many misconceptions themselves that is affecting the relationships between young men, young women, and young adults. In health services, it is true that on the one hand, we have sometimes amazing services for young children and for infants and for those in later adult life. But in between, the adolescents are often lost lost in the sense that they are not assured the kind of confidentiality that is required and the kind of training of health professionals who know how to approach these topics to adolescents in a discreet and confidential way. And then we, of, of course, these days also have the growing problem of mental health issues due to sexual violence and assaults on bodily integrity and human rights in online platforms. 
we need a paradigm shift. And that one is related to the UN concept of peace and security. Peace and security at the United Nations does belong in the Security Council, but it belongs in many other places as well, in UNICEF, in UN Women, UNFPA, and why? Because the concept of peace for us needs to be more than keeping peace between countries and preventing a third world war. It needs to include a culture of peace, which begins in the way we grow up, in the way we treat each other and how we deal with conflict, not only between countries, but in the home, between ethnic groups, at the workplace, and in public spaces. Security. Security requires us to feel personally secure. Not only to feel personally secure, to have food security, to have economic security, and all of that allows us then to exercise our freedoms and our human rights. And that means the right to make decisions about one's own bodies and protection by the state in all places. CEDAW, as you know, is the roadmap for human rights and bodily integrity. We rely on it as the only human rights treaty that holds governments accountable for gender-based violence. That's not only bringing justice, but preventing, preventing the conditions which allow for gender-based violence. And also for providing prevention of harm in sexual and reproductive health. It also ensures equal decision-making power about the policies which affect those services that are trying to reach us and about our environments in schools, in our villages, and for all different types of women and girls, indigenous peoples, whether you have a particular difference by religion or discrimination by race. CEDAW is our roadmap. And the CEDAW also has things called general recommendations, which are updates in a way for the committee members to reinterpret CEDAW for government reports and accountability. The one that I think is good for us to consider in this context is the, one of the latest ones, general recommendation 37 on disaster risk reduction and in the context of climate change. This general recommendation brings us to the reality of what we are facing today in health, which is a climate emergency. In order to have a healthy self, we also need a healthy planet. And in reverse order, for us to be able to accelerate action for a healthy planet, we need all hands on deck. And that means that we need women and girls in all parts of the ecology, the global ecology, to be participants and to exercise their human rights and freedoms. So this connection between the healthy self and healthy planet is something which I have given some thought to because of a situation I faced in Morocco at one of the climate change conference of the parties meetings when they were negotiating the treaty on climate. And I came into a room where many of my colleagues and friends were there who work in violence against women issues in sexual reproductive health issues and LGBTQI issues, but they knew very little about climate change. And I was given the responsibility to try to explain that to them. So I stepped away from the podium and I just had them look at me and I said, this is my body and it is my first ecology. I have to manage it, I have to keep it healthy, and I have the right to decide what is happening around it. 
And so I began to think about our bodies as our first ecologies, which is why we also have a human right to a healthy planet and do demand that our governments take action on that. More than 50% of my body and your body is water. That water needs to be constantly in our system. It has to be clean. It has to be available. But climate change is changing that situation for many of us so that we are facing droughts, we are facing floods, and natural disasters, which are changing that water availability. In small island states like the Philippines, the Maldives, and the Pacific Islands, the freshwater table is disappearing as salt water comes in under the ground and the sea is rising. We're going to have a freshwater shortage globally very soon for everyone. The other thing which we have, sorry, <laughs> is um, to think about the air. We breathe about 11,000 liters of air per day. That means every breath we take and every breath that comes out is interacting with the environment. And yet WHO calculates that nine out of 10 people in the world are facing pollutants in the air. What does that mean? That means when we grow up from childhood into adolescence and we are developing our reproductive health systems in our little ecologies, our bodies, that means that we are susceptible to pollutants which can cause cancer, which can damage our ability to reproduce well and healthily and to grow older uh, in, with, with healthy well-being. Similarly, our bodies need food security. We need economic security and good nutrition for our health. But there are drastic changes in food production which are happening because of climate change and because of the natural disasters. That means that there are food shortages. And that is on top of the poverty which has been created by COVID and in some countries by conflicts. So what can I do? Here are some things which I think would be available to you immediately to learn more and for you to contribute to. The first is the NGO forum during the Commission on the Status of Women 1966, uh, which is this year. And you can register here for free and join many of the events on CEDAW about the, learn more about the climate, which is the priority theme for this year's CSW meeting. And here, Women's Environment Development Organization, which I also am affiliated with. We are holding, in fact, on March 16 with the UNFPA, a special session on the relationship between climate change, sexual reproductive health and rights, and gender-based violence. Last July, I was in Paris to uh, be at the launch of something called the Action Coalitions. UN Women, Mexico, and France have sponsored these, but these are designed to accelerate action on the Beijing Platform for Action, which as you probably know, had 12 critical areas of concern, which covered everything for policy guidance. And that was passed by the world the largest number of countries in 1995 at the UN Fourth World Conference on Women. But we have seen irregular progress. And so these action coalitions, there are six of them, will try to accelerate action engaging NGOs with private sector, with foundations, with member states, and with youth groups. Youth groups will be a particular part of these action coalitions. So please go online, find out about the action coalitions at the UN Women website. Six of them, gender-based violence, economic justice and rights, bodily autonomy and sexual reproductive health and rights, climate justice, technology, and feminist movements in leadership. You belong in all of those. The other thing I want to share with you came out of last year's 75th anniversary of the United Nations. It was the Secretary General's Our Common Agenda Report. 
which was a result of two years of consultation with many youth groups, with millions of participants online, with governments, with UN agencies, on how we can accelerate action on the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs, for future generations. Future generations. There is, among the 90-some recommendations, a proposal for a youth council in the UN Secretariat. That is to be the interface, but also the voice of youth at the United Nations. Next year, there is a proposal for a future summit. What would our United Nations have to look like for the next 75 or 100 years? What can we imagine could revitalize it and make it available for our common peace, our common equality, and our common sustainable development. The last thing which I think would be interesting for you to investigate is a UNFPA campaign on body right, which takes its word a little bit from copyright and demands protection from online violence. And if you look at that, I think you will find it quite interesting, introducing a copyright for the human body, which is a campaign where you put a B on part of your body and put it on TikTok or on, on Facebook or on Twitter. And this body right is really a reaction to the barrier, which I mentioned at the very beginning, which is the pervasive violence against women and girls. So thank you so much for listening. I'm sure you're going to have a wonderful conference and I look forward to meeting you in person someday soon. Thank you, bye.